now. Hello, everyone. I'm Dylan Taylor, and welcome to our session, South by Southwest, Future Investment Opportunities in the Space Industry. Uh, it's fantastic to be here. I'm Dylan Taylor, CEO of Voyager Space Holdings, and uh, want to have uh, my colleague, uh, Sarisha, introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarisha Banla. I'm VP of Government Affairs at Virgin Galactic. Uh, I'm actually an engineer by training and have been a space nerd my entire life. Um, so really excited to go through this presentation and uh, hopefully we'll get some questions later. Um, we'll let you know how to get in contact with us and uh, love to continue this discussion after the presentation. Wonderful. Great. Well, let me launch the presentation here and uh, we will get right to it. Okay, fantastic. So future investment opportunities in the space industry. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the context of the industry to start. Um, every business plan I think I've ever read always has the hockey stick, the famous exponential growth uh, that happens in the future. But the fact is for space, we're actually hitting that hockey stick right now. Uh, it's not only a large market, but it is going exponential as we speak. And we'll talk a bit about why that's the case. Uh, whether it's Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or other leading Wall Street firms, uh, pretty much every analyst has space as a multi-trillion dollar industry uh, by 2040. Uh, these are numbers from Morgan Stanley. Uh, they're a bit dated from 2017. And even in their base case, they have $1.1 trillion market by 2040. So what's uh, dr driving that? Certainly commercial space is a huge uh, driving force, which Sarisha and I will touch on, uh, but there's also very large tailwinds from the government side. Uh, we are looking at not only increased spending around the world from space agencies, uh, famously uh, even uh, countries like the UAE uh, did a Mars mission this summer, but really also on the defense side, uh, creation of the US Space Force uh, the rise of China, hypersonics, other themes like that are driving a lot of space-based spending as well. This is a classic S-curve uh, industry. Uh, essentially, you have the past, which was really or has been defined by well-established large players that are uh, very well capitalized, uh, but also are a bit entrenched perhaps, and arguably not as innovative as they would like to be. And that's contrasted to the present where you have sort of a fail fast, Silicon Valley, highly innovative, highly flexible, highly adaptable uh, ecosystem that's really changing what it means to get to space in terms of the cost and really changing what we're doing once we're in space. This is a classic disruptive curve. If uh, you have read uh, Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen, uh, who was a Harvard professor who sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but the whole notion here is that disruptive technology typically happens uh, from the bottom up, meaning it's typically the low quality use cases uh, where that's most seen. And when we talk about rocket launch, I think this will be really uh, clear to everybody. If you look at SpaceX's first rocket, for example, uh, the Falcon, uh, you know, people joked at the time it was a toy rocket uh, wasn't going to do much, uh, wasn't very reliable, didn't have much capability. But of course, as they iterated and as they cracked reusability, which we'll talk about, uh, that unlocked the medium quality use cases. And then now, of course, the market has inverted, where even the highest, most reliable use cases are uh, awarding contracts to the likes of SpaceX. So this is really what's happening across the board in the industry as well. Uh, just to punctuate that point, here's a uh, graph of PC sales versus smartphones. Right around 2007, uh, for those of you old enough to remember, that was like a Palm Pilot maybe or a BlackBerry. If anyone would have said at the time that that device was going to disrupt the PC computer that was sitting on your desktop, uh, they would have thought you were crazy. But of course, that's what happened with the advent of the iPhone and later the Android platform to the point where there's actually more smartphone sales than PC sales uh, by a long shot. Uh, so this is a classic dis disruptive S-curve pattern. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to uh, Sarisha to talk about the major disruptors uh, happening in the space industry. Thanks, Dylan. 
Um, as you mentioned, in recent years, we are seeing an influx of new entrants into the space. Um, pun kind of intended. <laughs> um, but with these new players, um, they're bringing in new technology, um, but others are actually looking at approaches, new approaches to old problems like cost using commercial off the shelf parts, manufacturing, streamlining um, the manufacturing process so that we can create these vehicles for a much lower price. So innovation is coming in a lot of new forms in the uh, commercial space industry. Um, so a good place to start is the launch vehicle market, um, one of my favorites, and I'm not really biased <laughs> or anything. Um, it's actually just arguably probably one of the most visually exciting areas. Um, launch has always captured the imaginations of many, um, inspiring the next generation from the Saturn V, uh, launches to the moon, to the space shuttle, um, which personally uh, inspired me, um, to now new commercial launch players. Um, and you aren't paying really close attention to the space world. You probably haven't heard of each launch that's been taking place recently, but that's probably because it's becoming more and more commonplace uh, event. Um, as of February 20th, we've had uh, 14 launches. Eight of those were in the US. Um, five years ago, if we looked at it, um, by February 20th, we had three US launches. So we're really seeing launch become more and more high cadence event. Um, and there are great implications to these new entrants. Uh, Dylan, if you stay on the first, stay on the last slide, I just wanna talk about the implications of these new uh, entrants and the higher cadence and the new tech infusion for the launch industry, the cost coming down is definitely one of them. So as you see in the slide, in the days of the space shuttle with launch being inherently a government domain, costs of lifting a payload to orbit were high. Um, dissecting that phenomenal cost of operating the space shuttle is probably could be its own South by Southwest talk. <laughs> um, but in general, the shuttle's design involved a lot of maintenance, inspection, in, in addition to not really having a diversity of suppliers and for its you know, unique parts, as well as the cost of replacing items like the external tank, which was not reusable. Um, every time you launched, uh, the external uh, tank had to be replaced and it really skyrocketed the cost. That one, kind of pun intended. <laughs> um, but as commercial providers came onto the market, like United Launch Alliance and Orbital, we saw it with the Atlas V and uh, Delta IV, we saw those costs coming down. Um, the prices, the price to launch a payload was coming down. Uh, but it really wasn't until uh, even more new commercial entrants came onto the market, the most well-known right now being SpaceX, did we really see a drastic change in that price. Um, the addition of competition of, and growth of demand for launch uh, from the commercial spec, uh, space sector and an infusion of new technologies uh, really continue to drive these, these prices down. Um, and now we have even more entrants. Uh, last I checked my little spreadsheet, we had over 100 new launch companies coming into the market, uh, going mostly to LEO, um, but some to GEO and even further destinations. And a lot are focused on small satellites, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, bringing the price down even more. So if you go to the next slide, um, let's talk about reusability, uh, game-changing technology. Um, I mean, imagine taking a flight, well, pre-pandemic, imagine taking a flight uh, from New York to Tokyo and then disposing of the $200 million Boeing Dreamliner that you took to fly in uh, upon landing um, at Narita Airport. It's not very cost-effective form of transportation, right? Um, kind of in that same vein, many companies are taking that principle to space travel, reusing parts of their vehicle to cut down the price of launch. SpaceX has been landing their first stages um, and reusing them for future flights for years now and has become a regular occurrence. Um, so let me talk about what you're seeing here. Um, I'm not sure how many of you tuned into the SpaceX Falcon Heavy launch in 2018. Uh, it's a moment I personally will never forget. And I was actually in a meeting with the FAA when it was happening. So we all stopped <laughs> what we were talking about, paused our meeting and turned on to the launch. To, and um, as iconic as it was seeing the Tesla Roadster with Starman with Earth in the background, um, I think this is probably my most vivid memory of the launch, the landing of not one, but 
put two boosters in unison back on Earth. It was just with a space symphony. But Dylan, I know you were actually there. Can you share a little perspective on what you yeah. thought about the launch and your feelings? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Sarish. I was there. I had the, the privilege of being there. And it was it was like science fiction. I, I, it's the only time in my life where I felt like I needed to rub my eyes to make sure I what I was witnessing was was correct. And for those of you who haven't been to a launch, uh, it's almost like a spiritual experience, just seeing the raw power and just the amazing collaboration that humans can marshal uh, to do a space launch. And then to see these uh, rocket boosters reland. It literally, literally blew my mind. Uh, and in the back of my mind, the more rational part of my brain was thinking, okay, this changes the game, right? If you can do heavy launch and reuse, you know, two thirds of the launch vehicle, or certainly two thirds of the cost, that completely changes the game. So I was just astonished. And uh, it was a great day for space, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, launches like, like those just also just inspire the next gen, um, which is incredible. I mean, I grew up watching space shuttle launches and now we have uh, students and possibly our next innovators watching uh, Falcon and all these other commercial launches. So it's really a game changer in many ways. Um, so the next disruptor uh, we, want, we wanted to talk about um, was microsatellites or generally referred to as small sats and uh, the constellation architecture that they're bringing. Um, over the years, with the miniaturization of technology, um, i.e. technology capable of doing more and more processes in smaller packages, we're seeing a decrease in the size of satellites as well. Before, it was solely satellites that were the size of school buses, launching every few years to geostationary orbit. Um, and if the half a billion dollar satellite didn't work upon arrival, that was too bad. Um, there's still absolutely a need for these larger geosatellites, but we're seeing a new revolution, small satellite revolution. Uh, we're seeing satellites in smaller and smaller packages uh, going to lower altitudes, being able to perhaps not provide the, quite the same capabilities as its larger satellites, but capabilities that are enough for many commercial uh, consumers of those capabilities. Um, and these small satellites do complement their larger brethren uh, in geo. These satellites typically operate um, in constellations, so multiple satellites in orbit providing data more frequently. If one goes down, the cost of its replacement is minimal. Um, in addition, one of the advantages is that you can constantly refresh those satellites in the low Earth orbit with the newer, most up-to-date technology. Um, another item that's coming up, there's, you know, technology is cool, and I tend to talk about it a lot because uh, being an engineer, I just nerd, nerd out. Uh, but there's also a lot of policy imp implications on this uh, space traffic management, how to keep track of all of those assets. And Dylan, I know that's something you've been thinking about. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, that is an issue is uh, space sustainability and uh, debris, orbital debris. And um, just to give people perspective, there's about 1,700 pieces of hardware in orbit today, functioning pieces of uh, hardware. We'll launch probably as many uh, satellites is that easily in 2021. And then we'll likely increase that number again in 2022. Uh, in addition to that, you have little pieces of micro debris. And of course, if things collide, that creates more micro debris. Uh, to give people a perspective, a, a screw in orbit has as much energy as 100 pounds of TNT. And that's because it's traveling at orbital velocity, which is about 17,500 miles an hour. So it really is an issue. Um, space sustainability is, is important. And uh, I know Sarisha is passionate about it. I am as well. And it is something that I think the industry really needs to take, uh, uh, take more seriously and, and come up with solutions to try to solve. Absolutely. Um, it's a very, uh, it's definitely a uh, topic of interest, um, both in and abroad and commercial companies to do that because we need to make space accessible for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so quick, quick uh, comments on a on the data aspect of small satellites. And I think Dylan would probably say this is one of the more exciting parts of the small satellite revolution is the amount of data we're going to have. These satellites are imaging Earth constantly and at a rate we haven't seen before. And it's not only optical imagery, but we have 
like uh, SAR synthetic aperture radar, which is using radio waves, um, hyperspectral co collecting images over a range of wavelength. Um, but all of this data uh, needs to be collected and processed and put in a manner that's useful uh, to consumers. And there's multiple methods of interest to do this using AI, predictive analytics. Um, all of this will lead to opportunities for customers on earth. And it can be anywhere from predicting and tracking wildfires while they're in their infancy stage to save uh, people's homes and um, you know, large areas from damage to even just looking at parking lots, seeing when they're most full to predict uh, customer traffic and staffing for businesses. I mean, the possibilities are endless. And Dylan, I know this is definitely an area that excites you. I just wanna see if you have any additional thoughts well, I think, you, I think you nailed it, Sarisha, and captured it well. Uh, maybe just one other comment. When we talk about the investment uh, thesis here in a moment, one of the reasons this area is so exciting is it's very capitally efficient, right? Once you get the assets in orbit, you're pushing around ones and zeros. Uh, and with the advent of all these uh, data techniques that we have in the world, you can create some very superior insights. And those are very value creating. So just one thought experiment. If we have a $75 trillion global economy, if you had sort of perfect real-time information about all the machinery of that economy that was space-based or primarily space-based, could you make that economy 3% more efficient, 4% more efficient? You know, whatever number you pick in your mind, even 3% on 75 trillion is about 2 trillion of value creation, right? So uh, I think the opportunity here is huge. And this is why you see companies very large companies looking at building constellations or getting into the data and analytics game for space-based data. And, uh, and I think a lot of the capital, when we talk about SPACs a bit later on, several of the SPACs that have been announced are really more data and analytic uh, plays. And there's a reason for that, just given their capital efficiency. Absolutely. Um, and on a final note, with the rise of small sets, uh, we saw a rise of small launch companies. Um, in the past few years, we see multiple companies uh, enter this market, um, tailoring their business to small satellite launch, um, basically give small sets a ride to space. Uh, in the image, you see two companies, Rocket Labs and Virgin Orbit and their vehicle. Um, these, these vehicles are catered to small sets uh, because Small sets typically have to utilize what is called ride share, um, basically share a ride with a larger satellite. But that means they are going to that satellite's destination, um, destination orbit, uh, launching on their schedule, which is not typically an efficient way of conducting business when you are so tied to an external uh, party. So these vehicles are now offering small satellites um, the ability to choose their schedule, their destination, and to get where they need to to go on their schedule on when they need to go. Um, it's like uh, taking an Uber instead of riding a bus for small satellites, if I have to put it some way. <laughs> um, and finally, the last disruptor we're going to talk about is space tourism or the privatization of space flight. It's one of my favorites. Um, I went into the space business uh, wanting to go to space, so I've always been very passionate about this. Um, let me start off by saying, look, you know, with this number, less than 600 people in all of human, human history have gone to space. And why is that number so significant? Well, to date, only 582 people have gone to space. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see out of those people, only 24 have seen Earth in its totality. Only 12 have walked on the moon. And this is given roughly 110 billion people have ever lived. It's just such a small fraction of people have really been able to experience space flight to date. And the majority of those people have been government astronauts. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is the price. Um, the cost of going to space is on average 40 million. And that's kind of at the low end. Um, and that's you know a launch to go to the International Space Station. Not, too many people are willing or able to put in that kind of dough. And if, even if it is a once in a lifetime, incredible experience. Um, in addition, the access really hasn't been there. In the past, uh, not very many seats are available. Most of them have been reserved for government entities. 
But what's changed? What you're seeing on the screen right now is a private vehicle that has gone to space twice. Um, it was part of the Anasari X Prize. It was a prize that was awarded for not for basically a non-government organization uh, that had to launch a reusable um, spacecraft into space twice within a week. And Spaceship One was that spacecraft that won the Anasari X Prize. And you might see some familiar people in this picture. You see, you know, Anusha, Anusha Ansari, Peter Kimandez, Bert Rutan, and of course, Richard Branson, who ended up announcing uh, the creation of Virgin Galactic, the world's first space line uh, that will take people to space uh, back to space and back safely uh, with the purchase of a ticket. Um, however, ticket prices are still relatively high, starting around 250,000 per seat. But as additional entrants come onto the market and the cadence of flights increase and the technology matures, we'll see that price slowly come down. So this image is of course, uh, sorry, Dylan, if you go back one more slide, this image is Virgin Galactic's vehicle. It's called Spaceship Two. It's gone to space twice so far. Um, it's an air launch vehicle uh, taken up to about 50,000 feet under the belly of its mothership and released. And the image you see right now is after release when it lights its rocket motor to go to space. So if you go to the next slide, after the rocket motor burn, uh, the vehicle coasts to Apogee where um, the spaceflight participants in the cabin will have an incredible view of Earth. Um, we'll be able to unbuckle from their seat and float around. And the, the person you're seeing on your screen right now is Beth Moses, uh, VG's chief astronaut trainer who rode in Spaceship Two's cabin on the last flight. Um, but Virgin's not the only um, company in this space. If you go to the next slide, um, another very common name in the space industry, Blue Origin, is also offering flight to space for people and payloads. They use a capsule design with a reusable booster. So after the capsule separates, the booster will come back and land. Um, so they've flown multiple, multiple flights to space. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can actually see uh, an image of the capsule separating. Um, they've flown multiple, multiple flights to space, have landed their booster. They've flown uh, hundreds of payloads um, for both science, research, education. So in addition to opening access to space for people buying a ticket, you can also uh, fly a payload to space at a cadence that's really unheard of. Um, you can typically build and fly a space in a summer camp, which I think has great implications for our next generation. So, you know, I actually entered this uh, business with this, <laughs> this mantra. Um, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut. At some point, my eyesight got so bad that I did not qualify to be an astronaut. So I was trying to scramble, figure out, you know, what I wanted to do in my life. And I saw the Ansari X Prize and my mantra from, went from, I want to be an astronaut to, I can, can still be an astronaut. And, you know, Blue hasn't opened up sales yet, but Virgin has over 600 people signed up to space, to fly to space. And that means that once they get through that initial manifest of people, the number of people that have gone to space will have doubled, which is just incredible. And we're opening up space, you know, through uh, companies like Blue and Virgin and others, not only to, you know, a certain demographic of people, we're hoping to see uh, people from different backgrounds, different you know, countries, different upbringings, different cultures, all to go be able to go to space. And I think, you know, coming down and speaking about that experience to students and just to the public will have a profound effect that we cannot really grapple with just right now. It's just all so exciting. Um, but I will stop nerding out about uh, going to space. I could talk probably for the rest of our time about <laughs> why going to space is so exciting and turn it over to Dylan yeah, uh, to talk Dylan. about the investment aspect. Thank you, Sarisha. And you, you really uh, were so um, articulate and eloquent on that and, and inspiring. And, um, you know, space is nothing if it isn't a tool for inspiration and a tool for transformation. Uh, just to plug on a couple of nonprofits, we'll, we'll talk about the money side of the business here in a second. Uh, but Virgin Unite, uh, which I know is a great nonprofit looking at democratizing space and also Space for Humanity, whose mission really is to buy commercial space tickets via Virgin and Blue and send everyday citizens uh, to space. So uh, 
check those out if you're interested in getting involved in, in more of the social elements of the space movement. Okay, so let's talk about the investment uh, piece. Uh, Sarisha uh, has done an amazing job of talking about these disruptive forces. This has uh, unlocked the industry and, and the business plans, and this is part of the reason why we're growing vertically, or I should say exponentially. Um, so I'm going to bear with me a bit here. This unfortunately won't be Finance 101. It's probably more like a Finance 301, uh, and I'll try to um, try to uh, not lose anybody here. But there are some concepts that I think are really important to understanding space. Uh, that if we're going to do it justice, we really need to to cover it. So apologies for the eye chart. This is kind of a classic uh, risk versus return. A chart. And really what this shows is if you want a low risk, uh, which would be the bottom left there, a money market account, uh, typically that low risk uh, comes with a low return. If you want a higher return, you typically have, need to take on more risk. And so at the very kind of far right side, you get things like small cap equities, international equities, emerging markets, and then classically private equity. Private equity is really uh, and I'll talk a little bit about why it's riskier, but it really has more to do with the fact that it's illiquid. Uh, and there's this notion that liquidity and illiquidity uh, drive uh, expected return. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that because it, it, it does relate to space. So this is a kind of a classic chart showing a startup uh, ecosystem. And essentially at the very beginning, when you have a concept, your business is on a napkin, Typically, you're not going to be able to raise money from anybody other than maybe a grant uh, or a friend and family member or your checking account or your credit card. Uh, as you start developing that idea, you might get some people, uh, so-called angel investors, who are used to taking very high risk uh, for a very high expected return. Uh, and then later, once you actually start generating uh, sales, which is a little bit further on in your evolution, the risk has been reduced and then other investors are now uh, open to the conversation. And this is when you get investors like venture capitalists and then later public uh, uh, exit or public market investors. So the industry, if I'm looking at it over the last 10, 12 years, really was plugged at that early stage capital uh, formation piece. And uh, due to the hard work of a lot of people in the industry focusing on sort of early stage angel capital, uh, that essentially was unlocked, and we got tons and tons of new business formations over the last 10 years. And that's been incredibly healthy, and I think that has uh, generated a lot of the innovation that we're seeing. So we're essentially further along on this sort of life cycle of capital, if you will, for the industry. But what we're still a little bit blocked is uh, this whole notion of getting companies uh, to public company exits. Uh, there's some very exciting new developments, which we'll talk about. Uh, in the SPAC arena, so-called special purpose acquisition corporations. That's new to the space industry, uh, pioneered by Virgin Galactic. So that's helping a bit. Uh, we still need to get some traditional old fashioned IPOs done for the industry. And uh, that's something that myself and others are focused on. But in general, uh, we're starting to move that, uh, that, red, that black diamond uh, to the right. And ultimately what you want an industry to do is you want it to complete the full life cycle because once you have the public company exit and all that capital is returned to the early investors, they're then free to deploy that uh, into early stage companies. Of course, the industry has an incentive uh, to fund early stage companies more because they see uh, the pot at the end of the rainbow. And that's when you get this virtuous cycle. And this is what we've seen in tech and in software in other industries and space is right on the cusp of doing that. Here's another way to look at the capital life cycle. Uh, the valley of death is this you know, sort of famous trough that you have here. And all that's really meant to show is that when your capital needs are the most, when you actually need to invest in your platform in order to realize your business plan, typically that's when your risk is also very high. And there's very few capital providers that will step up and provide high levels of uh, capital expenditure uh, under a very high risk situation. And again, this is where SPACs have been uh, instrumental. And I'll talk more about that here in a second. Uh, the four horsemen of space finance. This is a term I came up with really to talk about the four barriers that have been holding space finance back. 
One has to do with the illiquidity. And again, that was because we didn't have a lot of public company uh, exits or sales to strategic investors. Second is risk. Of course, with space, it's not only technical risk, but it's operational risk. It's regulatory risk. Uh, space is hard. That's a famous uh, trope that people say all the time. And it, it, it's true. Uh, it's a very, very difficult industry uh, to perform in. High CapEx, this just means capital expenditures, high amount of capital funded upfront for an uncertain return on the back end. And that uh, that's typically very difficult for industries to overcome. And then last but not least is long time horizons. And all that's meant to say is once you invest the capital, when are you expected to get a return on that capital? And space has been a bit back end loaded where the returns are actually quite high, uh, but they typically don't materialize for several years. So those are the big four. And the way we're thinking about it, we, the Royal, we, the industry is, you know, how do we overcome these? Because as we overcome them, it will unlock more financing for the industry. So risk is really about um, things like scale, right? If we can scale businesses so that they're not vulnerable to a particular program or a particular uh, subsystem or a particular component, uh, that risk is just like any portfolio is spread out over a larger uh, basis. So scale is very important. Uh, things like uh, industry standards uh, also help with risk. They also help with capex. Uh, you know, imagine if you traveled the world uh, again pre-COVID, and every hotel you checked into had a different Wi-Fi protocol. Imagine how difficult it would be to have to carry all these different modems depending on, you know, what system you were on. So these are the kinds of things that space have been doing. Uh, we've been reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. Uh, it's not very smart. Uh, so we need more cap, uh, standards. Uh, then the unit volume goes up, capex is reduced, and the industry benefits. Uh, time horizons are getting shorter. We're getting better at innovating quicker. But for venture capitalists in particular, they're very uh, focused on internal rate of return. This is a term many of you probably heard called IRR. And famously, IRR is very sensitive to when cash flows come back to the investor. And uh, you're almost better off getting uh, smaller cash flows sooner than larger cash flows further in the future. It's just the way the math works. Uh, so oftentimes VCs, even though they'll say they have a seven-year fund or an eight-year fund or a nine-year fund, the fact is they really need to start harvesting that portfolio three or four years in to show the realized internal rate of returns so that they can then raise the next fund, right? That's the, that's the VC uh, uh, game. And so space has become difficult for a lot of VCs. And then, of course, illiquidity. Oftentimes, this is uh, solved by either large strategic companies buying smaller companies, which has happened. Uh, we also have some consolidation players. Uh, I, I run one of them, Voyager, uh, but Redwire is another. And there, there are other companies out there acquiring other companies. And then, of course, uh, IPOs. And uh, IPOs are becoming more prevalent because this liquidity uh, is important to investors. And with the innovation, and it's not really an innovation with the SPACs, they've been around for a while, but the proliferation of SPACs, uh, that has really uh, helped space unlock some of this liquidity. So speaking of SPACs, and, and uh, Sarish, I know you're a public company, so I won't ask you to get too detailed on commenting here, but if you just announced in the last uh, week, even Black Sky, a satellite provider, Astra, another uh, launcher uh, that's been to space, not quite to orbit, but close. Uh, Momentus, which is uh, branded as a space infrastructure company. Uh, and AST, which is sort of a pure play satellite constellation as well, with the promise of bringing sort of, um, uh, you know, universal text and cellular services uh, to a smartphone anywhere in the world, which would be transformational, obviously, if they were able to pull it off. Um, and, and maybe Sarisha, just love to hear your comments. Any, um, you know, the, the per perception that the Virgin Galactic SPAC has been transformational. It was a bellwether, uh, opened up a lot of opportunities for space. But what, what's your perspective? I'd love to hear it. Yeah, it was definitely unique being the first and going through this um, from a company perspective. Um, I'll have to say it was probably another iconic image with seeing the New York Stock Exchange dressed up with the Virgin Iris. Um, and Richard Branson uh, at the opening of the market that day. So um, it 
it's very interesting uh, from a company standpoint um, in terms of that experience of coming going from a private company to now a public company and having led uh, probably the kickoff for all of the rest of the companies. And it's uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how this plays out for the rest of the companies as well, because it is a very interesting uh, opportunity for commercial space companies. For sure. And I expect several more uh, SPACs to be announced. Uh, one of the benefits of being first is you have the coolest ticker symbol, Sarisha. So yeah. <laughs> well, absolutely. Well done. Um, all right. Well, let's let's keep going here. So, um, you know, part of um, part of the reason the SPACs have been so uh, interesting and transformational for the industry is there haven't really been great uh, opportunities for the industry to invest in space. And because of that, um, we haven't really uh, been able to get investors involved. And one of the issues with our uh, investment uh, industry, for lack of a better word, is you have to be an accredited investor, right? And so you kind of have, like our society, a bit of the haves and the have-nots. A credited investor, I, I don't know exactly what the latest uh, requirements are, but basically you need to have, I think, a net worth of over a million dollars or have made $200,000 in income each of the last two years. The point being, it's a very high bar. And so angel groups, very high risk. Um, there are some good angel groups out there. There are other angel groups focusing on space that just have extremely high fees. So I would just be wary uh, of those groups. But in general, angel investing could be appropriate, but again, you have to be an accredited investor, right? So most people aren't accredited investors. Uh, the other thing I would say on angel investment is I talk to people all the time and they say, well, I'm gonna make a couple of angel investments. And I, I immediately say, absolutely not, do not do that. Because honestly, as far as I know, no one is smart enough on planet Earth to pick individual winners and losers in very early stage companies, uh, nobody. Um, and so what you really want to do, if you're going to do angel investment, you really need eight or nine or 10 to diversify that risk. Ironically, if you do that, it's probably low risk because the whole industry is going to do well. Uh, but I would just really encourage you to have a you know, diversified portfolio of angel investments if you go that route, because it is quite risky. Uh, funds, there are many funds that have been launched recently. I wrote a blog article, uh, which you can find on my personal website, uh, dylantaylor.org, that talks about several. Um, these, are, these are good, they're space focused. The challenge is many of them are fairly new uh, and many of the funds are relatively small. Some of them are already closed to new investors. Uh, but I would encourage you to check that out. That could be another way to get involved. Uh, holding companies, I mentioned that earlier. There are a few that have formed that are consolidating uh, market share. Um, publicly traded, again, we just talked about the SPACs. There are some non-publicly uh, or non-SPAC publicly traded companies, like for example, Maxar, and then of course the larger firms like Lockheed Martin and Boeing, which really aren't pure play space but still would provide some space exposure. And then of course, you can also do what's called an ETF. Uh, there was one um, called UFO. It was uh, founded by uh, Jose Ocasio Christian, uh, who's a friend uh, at Kalis Partners. Uh, that's a great uh, ETF. Uh, Kathy Wood at ARC, who I think everyone, everyone knows, she's become quite famous, is talking about forming her own space ETF. And for those of you who don't know, ETF is just buying different space-based stocks, putting them into essentially a single instrument. So when you buy that single instrument, you get exposure to all those companies. So those are some options. And then of course, you know, more SPACs will be announced. Um, feel free, you know, we'll, we'll uh, talk about this at the end, but I'd be very happy to, to help people kind of think through options as well. And I'm sure Sarisha would be happy to hear from you also. But uh, the point is, Space is booming, the investment opportunities are uh, abundant, uh, but you have to be smart, I think, about how you exactly get involved. And it depends a bit on whether you're an accredited investor and it depends a bit on uh, your risk tolerance. So with that, um, I think we're done. Uh, Sarisha, um, it's been a real pleasure co-presenting with you and uh, everyone who's listened, uh, thank you for your interest. I'd be very happy to follow up with anybody. Uh, my personal website is dylantaylor.org. Uh, you can drop me an email there. 
you can reach out to me uh, also at uh, dylan.taylor at voyagerspace.com. Love to hear from you. I'd uh, love to help in any way I can. Uh, I, I like nothing more than to talk about space and talk about uh, space investment and finance. So I'd love to hear from everybody. Uh, and with that, Sarisha, I, I'd love to turn it over to you for any final thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Just echo those words. Uh, feel free to reach out to me, uh, sarisha.banla at virgingalactic.com or uh, LinkedIn um, or Twitter DMs, whatever, <laughs> whatever method of your choosing. Uh, I am not yet on TikTok <laughs> and I don't plan on being, so maybe maybe skip that, that, uh, that channel. Um, but absolutely, uh, this was such a great discussion talking about uh, when, when we think about access to space, you know, we think about the physical opening up the access to space for small satellites, for people, um, but we don't talk about the access from a finance perspective. And it's um, funny now that I, I sometimes I walk my dog and I have my Virgin Galactic shirt on and, you know, some random person's like, hey, I invested in Virgin Galactic, I bought stock. <laughs> and it's just a complete different environment than where we were, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago. So uh, this, you know, opening access to space is in all facets from the engineering to the business to investment. So this was such a great discussion. And I hope uh, anyone that has questions or want to follow up, please, please do. Thank you. Thanks, Sarisha. Good to see you. Bye-bye.